Hi, everyone. Welcome to our Knowledge Cafe. Um, I want to just first introduce a, uh, a short video. And then following that, I will introduce our session, which is titled Children's Data and Sustainability. Thanks for joining us. A multi-stakeholder United Nations Summit, the World Summit on the Information Society Forum 2021 was initiated in January and will culminate in the final week held from the 17th to the 21st of May. Representing the largest gathering of the ICT for Development community globally, WISIS provides a platform for those using information and communication technologies to promote sustainable development, highlighting the role of the WISIS action lines to achieve the sustainable development goals. So far, over 10,000 participants have joined in over the 120 virtual workshops featured directly through Zoom, through Facebook Live, or other applications. Shaped through more than 500 inputs and suggestions received from our stakeholders during the open consultation process, the agenda of the WISIS Forum features a weekly program with exciting workshops and sessions based on thematic areas deemed as important by our stakeholders. We're delighted to see well-balanced contribution in terms of geographical location, gender balance, and stakeholder type, which has shown the positive commitment towards the WISIS process and the strengthening of the WISIS implementation of activities to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals. The agenda and program of the WISIS Forum cover all the action lines and are aligned with the SDGs. Some of the thematic areas addressed, known as special tracks, include ICTs and gender mainstreaming, ICTs and older persons, ICTs and accessibility for persons with disabilities and specific needs, cybersecurity, and many more, all of which are available on the 2021 WISIS Forum website. The WISIS Forum 2021 also features a high-level track, which gathers high-level representatives from various sectors with ministers, deputies, ambassadors, heads of regulatory bodies, private sector, civil society, academia, and the technical community to discuss the role of ICTs as a means of the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals and Targets. The 2021 WISIS Chairman, His Excellency Mr. Maxime Parshin, and the High-Level Track Facilitators will provide an executive summary of the high-level track outcomes during the final week of the forum, sharing the emerging trends, challenges, and opportunities noted by the diverse group of high-level track facilitators through the course of the high-level policy sessions. The sectoral, regional, and gender diversity of our stakeholders is also displayed in our virtual exhibition space that was inaugurated on March 15th, as well as our various social media platforms. We invite you to follow the WISIS process on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for regular updates and exciting news about the forum, such as the fact that we received a record number of submissions for the WISIS prizes this year, with over 1,270 projects submitted and 1 1.3 million votes that were cast for the 360 nominated projects. Visit the WISIS prize website to learn more, with the 18 winners being announced during the 18th of May during the special ceremony. We are also pleased to announce that the WISIS Forum special track on ICDs and older persons will be initiating a special prize this year entitled the WISIS Healthy Aging Innovation Prize. Additionally, in collaboration with the Global Coalition on Aging, WISIS is co-organizing a virtual hackathon. With more than a thousand registered participants, the hack will continue until April. Hackers had the opportunity to meet with experts in the field of ICTs and aging during the three mentorship sessions featured. Stay tuned for the announcements of the four winners, decided by a distinct panel of judges and announced on May 17th during the final week of the 2021 WISIS Forum. We look forward to your participation and thank stakeholders for their contribution in shaping this year's WISIS Forum with ongoing commitment and support. We would also like to extend a warm thank you to our partners, without whom this forum would not be possible. Thank you, and we look forward to a successful WISIS Forum 2021. Hi, welcome to this session entitled Measurementality, Children's Data and Sustainability. I'm happy to see so many people here today and chances are you're here because you care about children and you care about their safety online. And in this next hour, we hope all of us here today informed by each of our own experiences will share insights and ideas about how to prioritize the well being of the world's children. Starting with protecting children's privacy and security online. We want to surface the group's collective knowledge to gain a deeper understanding of how to measure and protect children's data. 
Um, but before we get started, a few things. Um, the format of this session will be a knowledge cafe format. And what that really means is that we'll all be participating in a discussion and that the diversity of opinions that we all have is encouraged um, and input is encouraged. Uh, we hope for a lively discussion on the topic and at the end of the day to surface some new insights. So depending on the number of people who've joined by the time we start, I'm sorry, by the time our panelists finished, have finished speaking, um, we will divide up into breakout sessions where we can um, have a more interactive discussion on the topic. Um, and at that point, I'll give you further instructions on what to do um, in the event of breakout sessions. And just so you know, this session is recorded and it will be available on the event page of the WISIS website soon after we finish the session today. And now I'd like to introduce John Havens, Director of Emerging Technology and Strategic Development at IEEE. And he also serves as the Executive Director of the IEEE Global Initiative for Ethical, I'm sorry. <laughs> for ethical considerations in artificial intelligence and autonomous systems. Okay, now I'll be handing it over to John. Thanks, John. Sure, thank you, Kristen. And by the way, I made my title like seven pages long. So believe me, I-, I Yeah, thanks for that, John. Yeah, enjoy. <laughs> well, you know, thanks so much. My, I have four business cards I lined up next to each other. <laughs> um, anyway, Kristen, thank you so much for that introduction. It's an honor to be here uh, to represent IEEE at the WISIS Forum. Thank you to the WISIS team. Really excited to have the two guests that we have. Um, why don't we do this just really quickly because uh, we're gonna go to have our primary guests to start at the beginning of the program um, and, and answer questions in a longer fashion in a second. But um, just so you get to know them quickly, uh, Venera, if you wouldn't mind just doing a short introduction for yourself, we'll do the same with Sandy and then I'll do a level set about the content. But Venera, over to you. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, depending on where you're joining us from. Thank you so much for this invitation. I'm really excited to be on this panel. Uh, my name is Viniera and I work with AI, Artificial Intelligence for Peace nonprofit organization based out of USA uh, that is working on, you know, my role in this organization is basically looking how digital technologies impact the lives of children and adolescents. So I'm really excited to be on this panel to speak more about uh, this important topic. Thank you. Thanks so much, Vinyara. Uh, Sandy, same to you, just a quick introduction uh, uh, for yourself before we get to questions. Sure, um, Sandy Pedlin, the official name is Alex, faculty at uh, MIT, uh, helped create the Media Lab, which most people have heard of. And I'm on the board of directors of the UN Foundation Global Partnership for Sustainable Development Data. So major mentality is sort of in my, uh, uh, my courtyard. Well, and thank you so much. I'm so thrilled to have both of you because you are the perfect combination of guests um, for our conversation today. So what I'll do is for anyone who's attending, um, this is, I'm just kind of going over using this for my notes, the description of our session, but I pulled some stuff out to kind of level set again, our conversation, Sandy and Viniera, before I ask you some specific questions. Um, but as, as Kristen pointed out, measure mentality, children's data, but also sustainability. Now I'm gonna reflect a little bit just to be a provocateur uh, for our conversation. Sustainability, I think people often think about the word green, they think about the planet, which of course makes sense. But today, part of why we're talking about measurement, and I know Sandy has deep expertise in this area, is what you measure matters. And what you measure is also what you count or what you can count. Meaning a lot of times what we're gonna talk about today, there's aspects of children and what makes up their well-being, which by the way, is not just their mood, it's, what call, it's what's called their long-term flourishing. Flourishing goes beyond mood. It has to do with your actual physical self, your physiology, and also your mental health, right? So someone might look like they're in a good mood, but their mental health might still be affected adversely. And as it talks about in the description, right? And wanna be also very clear here from an IEEE standpoint and a WISIS forum standpoint, the conversation here, we're also always thinking about coming to a positive outcome, right? 
sometimes when we talk about these technologies or the fact that there is harm being caused, I want to be clear that whether we're talking about artificial intelligence or algorithms or technology itself, harm being caused is not necessarily because the people creating the technology are causing harm, right? The logic here is there's a lot of stuff that we actually don't even know yet. For instance, a quick story about Alexa um, uh, um, or, or, or tools like Alexa, sometimes kids have been saying to those tools, whatever the manufacturer, right? They'll speak to it like they're speaking to a person. Now, whether one thinks that's right or wrong, it is something that most people would agree empirically means it is affecting children's well-being in ways that society doesn't really know about yet because 10 years ago, these tools didn't exist. So just want to be clear that a priority here for our work with IEEE, and I know uh, I speak for Sandy Vanier, I think the same with you for AI for Peace, we're addressing these issues and examining them and really look forward to the insights, not just of our guests, but of any participants, uh, meaning all of you uh, participating today, to get your feedback on how, first and foremost, to protect our kids and to allow ourselves as a society time where we're protecting these kids to say, are they worth testing to identify, not the kids testing, are we worth testing these technologies to really understand what will improve, right? Not only not harm kids, that's a critical point about today is obviously we can't harm kids knowingly, right? But it's to also say, what about maybe improving their well being? That seems like it'd be a cool thing to do, right? So I just wanted to point that out. Um, also, some things as it's, uh, we have in our notes children have to be able to be curious, they have to have the ability to explore who they are. Um, and that's something in the digital age, let alone the algorithmic age, meaning with AI enabled. And that's even before we get into immersive gaming. There's so many aspects about kids and how they live their lives now. In fact, all of us, right? But kids haven't had the benefit, and I'm 52, of, of having their agency established before all these other realms have kind of come into play. Okay, I think you get the basic idea and I wanna to get to our guests first, uh, I mean, rather than having me keep talking. So um, I wanna ask this first as a general uh, way to ha have us get to know your work. And Panera, we'll start with you again. For about two or three minutes, can you talk about what should we be measuring? You know, AI for peace, obviously you do some different work with sustainability, but what is it with a context where I just said, what should we be measuring maybe that we aren't? Thank you, John. Thank you for the question. I think um, this is a very critical question that we need, we need to explore more in depth, really looking what is that we want to measure and what does success look like, right? And then I think the important thing is really from whose perspective. And here, you know, as a child protection specialist, you know, working in this field for over 10 years, I think, uh, you know, we need more advocates really voicing the concerns and the needs and rights of children and adolescents. So, so children and adolescents, basically, uh, it's a group of people up to the age of 18, according to the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Children. It is a treaty that has been most uh, universally ratified convention uh, treaty in the world. And so I would also like to give the statistic that according to UNICEF and ITU, one third of uh, users globally of internet are children and young people. So there is a big uh, group of people that we're talking about. And I think it becomes even more important that we understand, you know, what is the role and impact digital technologies are living in their lives. Um, therefore, I think the metrics that we need to measure really need to focus essentially on the well-being of children. So that is looking at their physical, uh, psychological, social well-being and cognitive uh, development. And I think these are the important things that we need to always bear in mind because uh, if we think today, children are the generation that is actually experiencing this for the first time. So we don't have enough research showing us, you know, what are the, what are the repercussions, uh, the consequences of different type of use. So it's really like an experiment that is going on. And that's why I think we need to, uh, you know, really pay greater attention to this uh, issue and question because primarily because we understand that digital uh, 
uh, technology tools have not been developed with children's needs and children's rights in mind. So they were not at the forefront or the, at the center of, you know, when these tools were being developed. They were primarily, you know, targeting adult users and often seeking uh, such interests as promoting profit and revenue, you know, for certain groups of people. And so I think, um, Therefore, it becomes essentially even more important that, you know, different types of technology companies work alongside with social welfare, with child development specialists to really understand, you know, how do we need to design those tools and programs in such a way so that it reduces the harm and risk that is that can be placed on children. And um, Therefore, I also think that the other thing that we always need to pay attention and always keep in mind, the fact that children are not a homogenous group, you know, so we need to understand that we have children um, in rural areas, you know, there are different disparities, uh, you know, depending on where you're coming from, let's say the global uh, north, you know, or the global south. And so, and as someone that is working currently uh, in a low and middle income country, there can be a big digital divide, you know, in this field, especially uh, given uh, the fact that we are uh, living through a big pandemic. There have been a lot of lockdowns. There have been schools going to online mode of education. And in many low and middle income countries, we experience that in rural areas, uh, there is a lack of access to computers, to internet. So this is not even possible that children are able to continue learning in such environment. So this is, you know, an issue of equity that we also need to look at. And even when there is an access uh, to technology or to computers and to internet, we also need to understand that there is an issue of digital literacy. Our children I, are they aware of different uh, risks and harm that can happen online? Are they aware that they're giving up certain rights or they're giving up their data uh, to certain groups? And I think um, this is another thing that we need to look in terms of like, how do we measure success and what kind of metrics do we use is like really looking whether children are taught about uh, risks online. And I think this is, uh, you know, something where we have a generation of children and young people that are just given the devices without any uh, um, prior education or learning provided to them. Um, this is really talking about digital literacy of children, but I think uh, the other thing that we need to keep in mind is that uh, oftentimes the regulations or uh, the guidance that exists relies a lot on the parents. So that parental controls, uh, the awareness of parents to be able to control and decide for the children what is right and what is not. Because again, you know, a child that is seven year old is going to have a different capacity uh, than a child that is 13, so and, and a teenager, so to speak. And so, you know, even reliance on the fact that parents will know what to do for what is best for their children is not uh, universal and especially can be, you know, highly uh, non-existent in uh, rural locations where parents themselves are not aware of the harm and risks. And so we have a generation where sometimes children are more savvy in technology. They're, you know, uh, they're using it much more and frequently than their parents. And so I think... Um, as a, as a child development specialist, I think it's a really an important issue that we flag and that we raise concerns around this issue because whatever that happens in their childhood is actually going to leave a big impact and it's going to influence their life and their health down the road, you know? So for example, if, you, if a child is experiencing uh, pornography or has been exposed to such images, it's going to have, you know, a lifelong impact. And we also need to understand that sometimes those, you know, the, the pornography, you know, they, they can circulate online for a very long time. And so causing harm perpetually in, in the lives of these children. And I think, um, as you have uh, rightly mentioned, you know, the mental health aspect of these things is also important because, especially in childhood, because, you know, given that 40% of uh, mental illnesses 
have their onset before the age of 14, it becomes even more crucial that we actually pay attention, you know, what is it that the children are experiencing? How is it actually uh, influencing their mental health well-being? You know, the fact that they're, they're on screens uh, uh, very late at night, is it interfering with their sleep patterns, you know, their further cognitive development? Because, you know, these are important issues and I think we don't have uh, sufficient uh, metrics and really measurement to be able to say, okay, this is good and this is not good because this is sort of a gray area that we have not experienced much. I think I will leave it off there and yeah, pass it on to you, John. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, you brought up so many excellent issues there. And um, one thing I love thinking about is like policy meetings, frankly, like this one, which is really cool, which is, but not just policy meetings. What if every business meeting or policy meeting started with the question, anything we're about to talk today, do we know specifically how what we're doing will improve the lives of kids? Not just you know the, the immediate users, but the entire value chain, uh, the families of people who make the technology to, you know. And um, I think a lot of people, I've asked that question sometimes and people are like, I don't know what you're talking about. We have to make sure the product gets out and, and it you know, brings value and doesn't harm people, but that it makes profit for the company. And I'm like, bah, 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 bah. I'm asking a different question. And by the way, one thing you mentioned, which uh, Venera, even the phrase lower middle income countries, that, that phrase, um, and by the way, all this is designed as provocation for the conversation, right? But even that phrase automatically delineates the world by commerce or economics or finance, where as I'm sure you know of Venera and, and everyone on the call does, because this is Absolutely. a global platform we're on today, parents around the world uh, indigenous cultures as well, there may be ways that children experience well-being that are new to a lot of people from the West. And, and uh, how technology is or isn't used even, all of that, what if the first question became, to your point, you made all these great points, and thank you so much. If the first point is, how does each child experience well-being and how does that improve? And that's the first question. Wouldn't that also, and now I'm making my own comment again as a provocation, right? Wouldn't that also change how we design technology and, and, and the effects we're looking for in terms of what we value most? So again, I didn't mean to get all preachy, but I really appreciate what you said, Venera. Now we'll go over to Sandy. Sandy, same question to you in terms of what should we be measuring as a person who helped foundationally create the UN SDGs? You're a perfect person to ask the same question to. Um, well, I'm going to go off the reservation, so apologies. <laughs> Venera basically covered all the sort of issues. And yes, we have these things that the world has agreed the sustainable development goal metrics to measure. Um, but I think there's a, form, a more fundamental problem, which is, do we understand what it is that results in children that thrive? And I'm gonna give you two stories. Um, one story is the results of 30 years of work by the US government of the research agencies, spending most of $100 million, getting over 750 uh, uh, programs, you know, universities, NGOs from around the country to study what makes a kid run off the rails versus be successful. It's called a fragile family study. So they studied kids from all across the United States. Over a period of sort of 15 years of the beginning, each kid was subjected to 22,000 measurements of them and their families. Everything you can think of, all the mental properties, all of the, you know, grit, all that sort of stuff. And then at the end, there was a, 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 a large group of people that got together and competed to say, can we use any of these ideas, any of these measurements to predict which kids would thrive and which kids would end up in terrible circumstances? And the answer is none of it was statistically significant. You just sort of stop for a moment, right? That means everything you think about development did not work. It's not just me, this is 750 groups, 20 years of effort. And it's not just, it's sort of work, it was zero. On the other hand, 
in a separate study. Again, every kid in the United States, in this case, they were able to show by rating the Internal Revenue Office records that exposure to people who are successful, role models, uh, was enormously predictive. And I'm not talking about a little predictive. I'm talking about, you know, 71% of the variance, if you know about that. That's like, it's like a, 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 a rule of law, practically. At predicting which kids would be successful. And it was locked in mostly, almost entirely by the time the kid was 10. And it was very specific. It was female role male models that predicted girls' success. It was male role models that predicted boys' success. If it was a model of success for starting stores, that affected the likelihood that the kid would start a store and be successful. If it was inventing mechanical devices, that affected the odds of being mechanical. But female success stories did zero to males. Male success stories did zero to females. IT success stories did nothing for mechanical ingenuity or, or, or entrepreneurship. And so I'd just like to submit that we don't know what, uh, we know some versions of harm, but we don't know what success and thriving looks like. The fact that you could have such a major effort by everybody and have complete abject failure. And this incidentally is published in the US's National Proceedings of the National Academy of Science. It's like the highest, best reviewed science in the world. Right? So that's one story I want to tell you. And the second story is um, we went to a culture that will actually answer questions regularly, Japan. Um, because most cultures, you can ask them things on their phones and they'll do it for a couple of times and, and they won't. But in Japan, if they say they will, they really will. And we've discovered that uh, the most important factor in mental health is positive social interaction, period, full stop. Again, just like the role model things. Um, and yet, that's not typically what people think about when they think about mental health. And incidentally, uh, depression just by itself, not all the brands of, of mental health, is the largest cause of lost years of disability adjusted life, period, everywhere. Not cancer, not accidents, not war, depression and, and the related mental uh, uh, damage that it does for that. Again, you know, most of our discussions ignore this extremely well-established fact. And, and I think that, that um, there's a sort of reconsideration of what we want to do uh, if we want to provoke thriving. Most of the things we've talked about are about protecting against harm is of course good. Protecting privacy, of course good. We know something about those things, but we don't know enough about thriving. And I think we need to, to think carefully about that and, and ask what can we do to promote thriving? So there we are, my preview. Uh, no, no, Sammy, that was excellent. Thank you so much. And I know my work in um, uh, positive psychology uh, this whole idea of studying things like gratitude, altruism, et cetera. There's a lot of studies showing for any age, it's not kid focused, um, uh, aspects of things like a family social dynamic and unit, you know, and, and issues of if people are sort of trained in any environment that, you know, the individual is important. And anyway, the whole point here is that what you brought up is, is key to this discussion, which is obviously there doesn't seem to be enough or from Sandy, from what you said, there is not, nearly enough or almost any um, research. And, and if there's not research, then it also means there's not, has, has not been a focus on the, the, the critical need to understand what does make kids feel like 
their, 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 or what does protect their well-being and their flourishing, et cetera. Um, I do know a woman named Ryan Eisler, who uh, most people on this call probably know because we've interviewed her for other IEEE stuff. She's done a lot of research showing things like, uh, you know, exposure to a nuclear and extended family can increase long-term flourishing. And also things like where a focus on education happens at a younger age, then there's less chance of kids, at least this is a US-based study, um, having issues with mental illness or things even like you know, crime. So all it is to say, again, what if the world focused first and foremost, or at least in the, every meeting, this was a first topic of discussion. Do we know that children in these digital environments, that they're safe, right? That's a big question most people are, are, are dealing with, which is fantastic. But the next question is most exciting with this, uh, Kristen and team, I'll assume we have enough. A quick question before I go into this next section. Do we have enough uh, folks for breakouts, Kristen? Yes, we do. In fact, we'll have three breakout groups. Excellent. All right. Well, now you have, uh, for all of our other attendees, thank you so much, first of all, again, to Sandy and to Venera for those incredible opening provocations. But now what we're going to do is break into three breakout groups. In a second, Kristen will tell you how that's going to work. But we're going to have three questions. The moderators for each of the three groups are going to ask similar questions to what I just posed to Sandy and Venera. Those questions are, what are the measures of success? So that just means today, and this is based on the, the, the program that IEEE Standards Association has called Measure Mentality. Measure Mentality, right? What is the mentality of what we measure? So right now today, when you do your breakouts, the first question is just, what do you see are the metrics of success today? Maybe it's profit, maybe it's value. And by the way, it's not about what you think is right or wrong. You just say what those are. The second question, however, is what do you think they should be? Right, and we heard from Venera uh, 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 focused on aspects of peace, Sandy focused on aspects of increasing children's long-term flourishing. What should they be? And then the third question, because that's really, again, how IEEE, and I can't speak for WISIS, but I'm assuming it's the same thing. We always are thinking about the positive aspect of these amazing technologies. How would the world look more positive and purpose-driven if these ideas, these metrics, and especially kids were prioritized in the ways that you'll answer in your first two questions? So again, I think our moderators have those questions. Kristen, over to you to direct us how to get to those rooms. Sure thing. Okay, so in a moment, uh, a little message will pop up on your screen and it will ask you if you want to join a breakout session. You actually need to click on that, yes. That'll automatically take you into one of those sessions. You'll actually be um, randomly assigned to one of the three. Um, and then once you're in the session, you'll see the three questions in the chat and we can discuss. Um, and then at the end of the session, you'll notice there will be a countdown um, for I believe 60 seconds to two minutes. That'll just let us know that we'll be automatically taken back into the main session and you will be automatically muted at that point. Um, and that's about all we need to know now. Um, one note is that please feel free to take part in the discussion. That's what this is about. And also, if you don't feel like speaking out loud and you're better at the written word, please feel free to contribute to the chat in that room as well. We want everyone to feel comfortable and take part. All right, with that, I think we will go into breakout. Thank you. Um, and if you're comfortable, please turn in your camera. If not, no worries. Um, but our first question, as we just had in the breakout room, which is, what do you think the measures of success are today, especially in relation to kids and, and data? Anyone have any thoughts? And I'm not above calling out people by name because this is about you know, hopefully giving us some thoughts. Uh, Sabine, Tala, Dinara, Adesayo, any thoughts? Can you get back to me? I want to make sure I can give you the correct answer because I have a few of them. Well, Sabine, I, I, why don't you go ahead and go? I don't think there's any quote wrong answer if you feel comfortable. Okay, repeat the questions again because I started writing it. Oh, okay. And uh, the first one is what are the measures of success for like AI technology today, especially in relation to kids? Okay. 
I did have a question. Oh, okay. So What's your question? Sure. When you do say kids, are you putting them all in the same bucket or are you looking at age? Are you looking at culture? Are you looking at ethnicity? Um, that's a broad, so that's why it had me asking a question. Can you please be more granular as you are collecting data? Because culture, race, ethnicity, age, um, within the United States, outside of the United States, religion, all of that affect what a kid is. Well, it's excellent. It's an excellent point. And, and would you say then, and, and again, Sabine, I'm doing this for the sake of the, 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 the direction of the call. It sounds like a metric of success then that we should have is specificity. Am I right? Like meaning if there's rules that came out from say the EU or North America, those might be more applicable, first of all, to those regions. And then secondly, if they're too general and don't say kids under the age of 10 versus whatever, that, that can also be a risk. Anyway, I don't want to put words in your mouth. Does that make sense? In collecting that data, if you say specificity, oh, it's not my word, but certainly um, it's like a question before a question. That's a very broad question with the first one. And if you are looking to obtain the data, what are you looking to do with that data? So it's more important to say, what do you, what, what, why is that question being asked and what is it that you plan to obtain with that question that's asked to then be able to hopefully um, get the response that will allow you to do the proper research. So that's why it's a little bit of a challenge for me to answer. I do not think that I could properly answer because I'm too analytical and it would force me about 10 more questions. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, let me ask you this, Sabine, would you, if you don't mind me asking, what region of the world are you from? U.S. Oh, you're from the U.S. Uh, what do you think the measures of success are for kids under the age of 10 in highly urban areas in the U.S.? Does that help? Not to be difficult, but then you get granular. When you said urban, did you indicate urban? I did, just because I'm trying to be, be helpful, if that makes sense. And by the way, I'm not trying to put you on the spot. This is really helpful, what you're saying. So now the question is, um, define that, please. Meaning, I just would be interested, say, let, let me make it this way. And then I'll also call in some other folks, Sabine. And, and how about this, Sabine? Why don't you, let me just see if there's anyone else with other thoughts. And you've been really gracious. I have another question to ask you, but I'll, I'll come back to you if that's okay. Um, uh, Dinara or Adesayo. And again, thank you so much. Oh, Tala, you have a. Yeah, I just, I, I just had a question just to complement what Sabine has mentioned. Um, what data are we collecting? Because, because before measuring the, the why are we collecting it, what are we collecting it? Hmm. I think the logic would be picture of, I'm going to say a child in the States, the age 13, at least at one point, was still a big deal, right? In terms of a, a, a law called COPPA uh, is the acronym. So let's say it's a child who's 13 or under. And I think the reason this, this conversation is, is interesting that we're having Am I right in thinking, and, and Tala, I'll put this back on you as it were, a lot of policy is maybe made in very general ways which aren't considering the age, the region, the specific stuff uh, Sabine was just mentioning, and then also what data is collected. I think the issue here is usually when there's a PII data, meaning very sensitive data about a child being collected, that's, that's probably the biggest concern. And so measures of success today uh, I'm going to start negative, might be how can we gather as much data about a child as possible um, that don't honor the spirit of the law that exists, and the goal there would be to target them to sell them stuff. I don't know if that helps, Tala, but I'm just trying to help. Yeah, I'm trying to understand. It's a really difficult question, actually. <laughs> this is why, from my side, it's, it's really hard to, 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 um, to give an answer. But I would say that uh, in any in any development, we would need to think. I mean, the end user, the product by design, to think it like these are the end users, and and start the the overall user experience by integrating these end users with our kids. 
when designing the products themselves. That's a great point. I'm wondering, do you think, uh, and it could be the way that I wrote the question, so I, I certainly take responsibility for that, but do you think that if the measures of success for a child using a product are this and maybe they aren't vague, you know, Tala, to your and to Sabine's point. I'm not saying that like companies are not thinking about we're selling to, you know, a certain gender and a certain age range in a certain region. I used to work in PR with, you know, companies like Gillette. That was always the question. But usually the measures of success in my experience are we don't want to harm the child, right? So physical aspects of the of the product. Okay. Um, and then we want to sell the product, which that of course, that's how a company is sustainable, uh, profit-wise. But if those were the measures of success end. The goal of this call, the whole call, the 60 minutes is to say, is there an opportunity to say, what if the measures, and this goes to question two. So Tala, if you want to speculate, right? This is about having fun imagining too. What should they be? There's not really a wrong answer here because this would be just your subjective thoughts. And Tala, do you have any thoughts there? What should Yeah, I, I think I would I just take two minutes to think. I now understand better your question and I just need two minutes maybe to think it and I'll give the floor to someone else to maybe have. All right, no, thank answer. you. Thank this, you. We'll go to Vladimir and thank you so much for tell for your thoughts, Vladimir. Thank you for uh, allowing me. And uh, more more than that, I thank you in advance for um, uh, coping with uh, my understanding of the question. Uh, so things that come to my mind, uh, and this is something always very good to um, uh, be uh, you know go with, are the first associations. So maybe they're completely wrong, but perhaps this is something that AI is helping us to do. So what AI can do uh, is capture uh, sensations, uh, you know, through different, you know, eye, eye movement, different kind of body movement, uh, different kind of, uh, you know, output and understanding of uh, why someone is doing something. So with kids, uh, you know, being so uh, honest, uh, often naive, I think um, it would be easy to measure whether they are happy in the classroom uh, with a particular teacher or with a particular content, uh, with a particular technology used. Uh, and this is something that we could think of, uh, you know, uh, in, at least, uh, you know, how AI is uh, helping and, you know, following and shaping the future of education by, you know, really uh, taking the data. Uh, there are different ways of, of doing it. Not sure of, um, you know, the, issues that are going ahead with that. I'm just thinking about uh, the technology and their capacities. Uh, probably very, very similar, it could be outside of school, but school is a very focused uh, group, uh, has very, you know, well-defined well boundaries. And I was thinking uh, of this, um, you know, uh, the data that we can already think of having. Uh, I'm not sure if this is correct, but you know, uh, some time ago, I heard that um, if not all, but, you know, uh, the idea uh, to have all schools in China already uh, teaching uh, on artificial intelligence and uh, preparing their students at very young age to uh, understand this uh, and then, you know, use it uh, for, the, for the future. So I'm sure that, um, you know, um, it, this is already, you know, being uh, discussed and some uh, KPIs are being measured. Uh, we wonder how uh, will they uh, affect us back. But to you know, go back to you know uh, other things that um, uh, came, came came to my mind is uh, really uh, going back to uh, my previous colleagues uh, saying, uh, who can really afford to uh, discuss these new technologies, uh, not only in theory but in practical terms. So. Maybe even in theory, we can talk about how much uh, you know the, the just you know the word AI or artificial intelligence in mesh is mentioned in notebooks, is you know really covered. Just think, to think about you know uh, its aspect of you know being aware, or you know AI itself can help us collect uh, different kind of other uh, data that doesn't have to be you know on AI. It can be on on uh, any other uh, reason what we would like to have. What is the idea, as you mentioned? We want uh, our kid, children to uh, be content, uh, be uh, curious continuously, uh, that their mind is, you know, this is reducing any kind of uh, attention deficit disorders. 
that um, we are really having an engaged child uh, in school, outside of school, um, that is, uh, you know, willing to, you know, learn to use different techniques outside of the offered techniques and to see which, you know, edu you know uh, technique, pedagogical technique, often, maybe even more than educational, uh, is to be uh, a part of, uh, you know, the curriculum or the approach. I think this pedagogical, I want to stress out a bit more because uh, often people are talking about the curriculum and, you know, you know, the different subjects, but I don't know how much, uh, you know, uh, pedag pedagogical approaches are stressed within each teacher, uh, educator out there. And in this regard, I would go back into understanding the different age of children and uh, saying that uh, it's always those uh, uh, more sophisticated, let's say, educators that are willing to spend time with only PhD students, postdoctoral, maybe masters, some of them will go teach at this university, you know, and then, you know, uh, the need actually to transform this and having the most, uh, you know, uh, brilliant educators be in our kindergartens where, you know, most of yeah. uh, us are being created is missed. So maybe, you know, uh, this technology can help us uh, in this aspect as well. So this is something that came from my side. No, thank you so much, Vladimir. And I'm only cutting you off because we have four minutes. Uh, or, or thank you, uh, Talo, back sorry, to you. Sorry thank you, Vladimir. Yes, um, I'm, I'm just going to be quick. And now maybe I understood the question. I would say if if AI would, would help us get a more personalized approach in accompanying our children to understanding the basic needs of my child and have a really personalized uh, assistance to the child, uh, by understanding his own behavior. Perfect. So again, Tala, thank you so much. And Vladimir, uh, along the same lines, what I love what you're saying too, Vladimir, along the same lines, what you just said, Tala, is it sounds actually like the ultimate goal, a metric for success is actually more about the children than the technology, right? It's about the technology Perfect. facilitating, right? But that oftentimes, I think what we've examined or why we wanted to do this whole content was that oftentimes isn't stated as the primary goal. You know, but anyway, um, before and thank you, Tana, um, Sadin, Adesayo, Dinara, um, any any thoughts from you, and then we'll do our last question really quick. All right. Well, then, last question is: Have fun with this last question. How would the world look more positive if, like all the great stuff, Vladimir, that you said, children were, you know, we could recognize their expressions when they're happier or their long-term well-being is increasing? Does that mean in five years from now, we would know how these technologies, not coercing them, but would in increase their well being? Give me the perfect, beautiful world uh, in five years from now if everything goes as well as it can. Does that make sense? Like, dream a little. How, how are our kids prioritized? How does the world look better because of these technologies if they are measured in a different way? And Sabine, you asked me to call back on you before we ended. So if you have any thoughts, Sabine. I do have a thought, but it's a question, of course. That's um, OK. <laughs> in the United States currently, we are dealing with systemic racism. So how does the world account for a child who deals with systemic racism but does not acknowledge that until the child grows up to be an adult? Oh, that's a great question. Before I give my thoughts, does anyone want to respond? We are entering uh, an era where um, we could, some already know <laughs> or don't, but. Um, we are, you know, getting to a possibility of, uh, you know, not a real mind reading because that's probably, uh, far, you know, far fetched or uh, impossible at all. But based on data and the uh, expressions of, uh, you know, people, uh, going back to Sabine's uh, uh, question and statement, we might know, uh, and people might be exposed, and maybe because you know, just being exposed will make them, uh, you know, truly. Uh, be a better person, understand uh, who they are uh, as a member of the society. 
uh, how to be equal? What does it mean to be, you know, democratic? What does it mean to, you know, use the technology smart? So it's always been a balance, you know, going back to your question, you know, the happy world must have a lot of disconnected from technology, natural behavior that is, you know, of course, helped and shaped uh, in all, you know, matters, as long as there is a consent from the user, whoever they are, to be a part of providing this data uh, to those who are collecting, and of course, having all the right to know how the data is used and what are the results. So this is something that I, I, I would think the happy world should be, that we're really living in a transparent world, you know, open to our own failures. Uh, no one is perfect, and let's let's start with that, including technology. Mm. Uh, Vladimir, by the way, where are you from, if you don't mind me asking? What region? I'm uh, originally from, from Serbia. So, but, um, you know, I've been educated in the States, and I've been living in, um, in Switzerland for more than 10 years. So, I don't know how, how to go, go around this question. I always wanted to be um, someone above not because of my ego. It's just, you know, I, I've been in a place where um, uh, pe people are really put in, in boxes and uh, I wouldn't come to where I am if I stayed in one of the boxes. Well, so, thank you. Um, thank you for your thoughts and everyone else. I think we're kicking back. <sighs> yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I think this is a topic that many of us are passionate about, you know, and I think if we really say that children are our future, we need to think about, you know, what our children today are going to thank us for tomorrow, right? So I think yeah. we have like a, we have a really big responsibility. Well, quite to challenging to, yeah. <laughs> totally. Yeah, but, but you're right, yeah. Yeah. So I suggest that we start off. I think we have eight participants in our room. And so starting off with the first question, what are the measures of success? So how do we define success? What does success mean for you coming from your own organization or your own background? So yeah, please go ahead, take the floor. We'd love to hear your insights. I just put the questions in the chat, but I think I will uh, do that again because I, I, think uh, it disappears I did a little wrong. So I'll, I'll do it again. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, I'd like to just start off with the comments that John made at the end of the session. Uh, really, I think when we look at the technology, I don't think it's either or, you know, harm or benefit. I think it can do both things. So we, you know, like I was just thinking about an example of socially assistive uh, rob robotics for children with, with autism, you know, how sometimes it can be really an important uh, opportunity for children with autism, you know, especially when therapists are not available 24-7. So I think it's really like leveraging the, uh, the good or the positive that the technology can offer us, but also trying to understand, you know, the harm and the risk, right? So um, how about we, I would like to give a, maybe like 30 seconds to introduce yourselves perhaps. Yeah, I, I can start. Uh, yeah, so my name is Vicky Harisi. I have a background uh, in developmental psychology and I'm uh, uh, the last uh, six years I'm working on child robot interaction and I have been working on uh, with children with autism. So the, the example that you brought is very familiar to me because this was, uh, I mean, this was a project that um, I mean, opened an amazing window on uh, for me for for the great opportunities in in this field. But lately, I'm collaborating with UNICEF and uh, a project on AI, a child's rights, and uh, we are exploring specifically for robotics uh, what are the challenges and the opportunities uh, from this lens of child's rights, uh, um, especially especially for embodied AI. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Graciela, would you like to introduce yourself? I think you're muted. Please unmute yourself. Graciela, you're still muted. Thank you. Now? Yes, perfect. All right. 
And uh, I am a psychology um, social, and I, I speak more or less English. And um, I have pupils, and I am very interested in robotics um, uh, with uh, medical science. Yes, this is the, the very important things I, I am trying to um, impose in pupils, mm -hmm. uh, babies, on uh, adolescents. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. Not that. Uh, Matt, Matt Haven. Would you like to introduce yourself and perhaps share your thoughts on this question? Hi, uh, I'm, a, I'm a research in AI and uh, I particularly believe uh, that uh, all technology should be inclusive to uh, all age groups. So that's my first thought. And uh, second is like, uh, it should be safe. So uh, to both elderly as well as the younger community. So, uh, and uh, things to do, and uh, I think even today there are too many things to do. So yeah, so that's my uh, giveaway to the community. After attending uh, both UNICEF as well as, uh, what to say, w uh, WSIS uh, aging community, this, uh, like, this, this feels like, uh, uh, no, more important now than ever, actually. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, you so much. Anybody else would like to introduce themselves? While we're waiting thoughts? for someone yeah. to um, step forward, I just thought I might mention that we'll have approximately 15 minutes to talk. Um, and at the end of that, uh, we'll go back into the main room and I'll summarize things generally for others in the main room. And do feel free to join in the discussion. Thanks. Yes. And I thought perhaps, Vicky, I would give the floor to you. Uh, just, you know, if you would like to share what would be the, you know, what are the metrics that we can use to measure success for children with special needs. So, so for example, children with autism and you know, how would the world be different and more positive if we did that? Thank you for sharing your thoughts. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, I have just to tell you that uh, I'm, I'm not a specialist on, on special needs. Uh, so I work typically with typically developing children mostly, but I only participated in one project with uh, children with autism. Uh, so I believe, I mean, for me, this question is really, really challenging. I don't think I have a clear answer myself. So what I think um, success is uh, so multi I mean, there are so many factors that define success and it is so um, uh, um, sometimes even subjective. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that for me, it's really, really difficult to, to give an answer. Uh, the only, um, I think the only input probably from my studies on child robot interaction that I could give here is that uh, um, I, what what I would like to do with my research is to work on children's uh, zone of proximal development, which means that on their potential. I think in your talk I mentioned uh, children flourishing. It's the same thing. So um, sometimes uh, because of technical limitations, so when we work with robots, with physical, with embodied AI, sometimes we have uh, uh, very um, uh, controlled environments, very well defined, etc., which do not leave um, the space for children to explore, to play, um, and uh, uh, to be free to, to create themselves to, uh, with their imagination, etc. So for me, um, for the future, uh, I would like to see more open-ended settings, technology where children can, can um, work on, or we can support children's um, John proximal development and uh, oh. and let them uh, design their own learning tra trajectories, etc. So for me, this is somehow the way that I would like to frame it. Mm. 
Vicky, thank you so much. I think that you're highlighting some really important aspects that you know, we need to also look into child participation and also leadership in these matters. You know, if these are the people that will be creating technology tomorrow, we need to instill them, you know, in them those important values, you know, that we want to promote and respect children's rights. What does that mean? And also, how does that look like for different vulnerable groups, right? Because, for example, you know, we have children with disabilities. That's, you know, one set of category. What about children without parental care? You know, there is a lot of, like, reliance on parents protecting and safeguarding their children, but what about children that are on the streets or orphans that do not have such care? And I think, uh, you know, there are lots of things that we can explore in terms of like positive development, right? And I think I agree with you that we need to provide like ample opportunities, for example, learning how to do coding, right? Exactly. Also like learning different types of games so that really facilitates their creativity. Uh, it can really spark innovation. It can also really, uh, you know, promote uh, greater learning, I think. And, yeah. you know, and we don't know, this can be really, uh, you know, creating some big innovative tools for tomorrow. So I think those are really important issues that you're highlighting. Absolutely. And uh, I would like just to ask to, to add very quickly, um, I just finished a, a study uh, in Uganda in a rural area in Uganda with children there. And uh, what I've seen is that even even I mean, participation and inclusion is really important. So for these children, it was amazing to see how how they I mean, the, the feedback that we had when we told them that uh, uh, we have this study, I mean, there in their school in Uganda and in Japan at the same time. So we, we brought together two classrooms and, but, but for them, it was not only about the technology, it was like a, a, a kind of life purpose uh, for them. So it was not only, you know, although we use technology to run this program, but it was beyond the technology in the end. So I wanted just to add this aspect here of inclusion. I'm, I'm interested in hearing more about that, actually, um, and, and how, how that could, could feed into, I'm, I'm imagining, uh, question two. Uh, what do you think the measures of success should be? I'm, I'm very interested in the program and hearing more about it, actually. <laughs> Uh, as, as I mentioned in the beginning, I don't, I don't think I have a clear answer to this because I, I, that, that's why I, I was really curious about this uh, session today. Okay. <laughs> because I wanted to find an answer, so I, I don't have an answer myself. So what, what I'm trying to say is that uh, uh, for, for me, uh, the, the measurement should not only be uh, focused on on the use of technology. So it's 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 beyond that. Technology, I think, for what I've seen, even for the children, is only a means. So it's only a tool to 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 develop to to uh, you know to help them imagine their own world, uh, uh, future development, etc. So. The measurement, I don't think it should be focused only on technology. This is my impression. Although in my studies, I have to admit that I usually measure the, you know, robots' uh, impact, etc. So I haven't uh, achieved yet that point. But I think this is where we, sh I mean, at least for me, I should focus in the future. Got it. Thank you. Um, and I'm wondering if you could just hazard a guess. I don't want to pick on you too much, but um, how could we, like, what measurement per se would you think of when you think of a measurement that's not technology? And I know this is really hard, but and maybe somebody else in the in the group might might have ideas. So how would we actually go about doing that? And sorry, Venera, I'm sort of jumping in here. Oh, um, really, feel free yeah. to <laughs> just go in the direction that you wish, but I was just curious in this case. <laughs> like if you were I can, to- I can, I, I can give an example or, or probably I can leave someone else to, to talk about this. Or uh, maybe there are some other people who oh. are like, yeah, Matt Haven. Yes, please go ahead. Uh, so 
I was just wondering, you know, success can also be measured as uh, what to say, uh, people's interest actually. So, uh, for for example, uh, the case of Finland. So you might be, I mean, I might have seen uh, they have been the news like you know for having the highest success rate for getting educated people uh, people out actually. So uh, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, uh, so this is from the World Economic Forum. Not sure. This is this is not even World Economic Forum. There's some general news that that has been circulating in the community. So, uh, I believe. Uh, so they 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 don't have uh, what to say strict classrooms. They do have something called uh, you know open classrooms they, uh, that they can attend. Like uh, the electives are very. Uh, uh, the, the, uh, they, they can choose electors whenever they want, actually, at uh, a very uh, lower age, actually. Yeah. So giving a choice is also uh, leads to a uh, rate of success, actually. Yeah. So that that's my perspective. I hope I, I didn't diverge a lot, actually, from the original topics here. I didn't want to uh, go into AI, but uh, yeah. This is that actually, yeah, mm -hmm. as a data you. perspective. Yes, from the data perspective. Thank you so much. Yes, and I'm also thinking that, um, you know, we can also tease out, you know, the existing uh, markers of success, like for example, learning achievements of children, right? And just to see, you know, what has been uh, the role of technology, what how technology has facilitated the achievement of that goal. And I also think like di different levels of well-being, like looking at the physical health. Uh, you know, mental health, well-being, uh, the social uh, interactions, you know, how it is being facilitated and being enriched for children, and also uh, psychological well-being, as I said. And I think this is um, really looking at different levels, but I think that we also have a challenge of, you know, how do we measure that? You know, oftentimes these are very, uh, you know, metrics that are, you know, subjective, as you mentioned, some of you mentioned, and also it, we need to make sure that we develop, you know, some kind of um, indicators for success, right? How do we really actually measure that? And I think the important thing that we need also need to bear in mind is that the global, I mean, the world is diverse, so it's going to even differ from one context to another, you know, even within the countries uh, specifically. So I think this is a really like an important topic that we can have uh, um, uh, like, you know, more discussions on. And I think this is something that is really essential as John has initially mentioned that what we measure is going to be actually what we're going, to, how we're going to really measure progress. And I think that's why it's quite important that we have like a wider discussion and um, dialogue on this. Yeah. Anybody else would like to make any additional thoughts? Sure. Yeah, please go ahead, man. So uh, we, I, I, I just. Please go Just ahead. one, uh, uh, very, very shortly, I know that OECD now is working on something which I believe is really important, that is about uh, um, the measurement of creativity. And I believe that for children, creativity is really, really crucial. Absolutely. So uh, so developing technologies, AI, or embodied or disembodied technologies that allow children's creativity, I think this is really crucial. And I really hope OECD to come up with a, a set of metrics, as you said, where we can measure probably the development because for children is, I mean, for children, everything is about development. So the developmental stages and, and the development of, of these uh, skills that consists creativity, whatever that is, I, I know it's extremely complex, but, uh, but I really like their work. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much. And uh, generously uh, within um, this complex um, socioeconomic world that we need to initiate them into properly. Thanks. Mm -hmm. so, now, thanks. Um, thank you. Uh, we have uh, Robin. Robin? I don't know if you want to say a few words. If not, we could. Uh, yeah, I had to unmute. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. 
Um, yeah, I write about education. I've read Sandy's book, Social Physics, and uh, I monitor the, all, all this activity. And I listen to um, I listen to uh, John's interview with Rianne Eisler, and I've read her books as well. So fantastic! Thank yeah. you. Welcome. We have Sean. Sean, I don't know if he wants to say a few words. If not, that's okay. Zoe? Hi, all. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Great. Uh, it's good to be with you guys today. My name is Zoe Hare from McLaren. Uh, I'm currently based in Amsterdam, uh, and I'm working as a junior project officer at ITU. But aside that, I'm also a student studying political science and uh, media and culture. Fantastic. Welcome. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be, I, my apologies if I mispronounce names, so my, I'm so sorry. Uh, Shazab? Shaz, uh, uh, hi, everyone. Yeah, this is uh, Shazab. Um, I am a part of the WISIS team, and I'm here to just uh, facilitate this, uh, this meeting room and to record the session as well. Ah, thank you. For and your I'm time. based here in Geneva. Fantastic. And uh, it bit some. It bit some. Okay. Well, welcome everyone. So we are in a breakout room for uh, I guess maybe about the next ten minutes or so. And we did put the questions in the, the chat. Uh, Sandy will be so kind to help facilitate us through these discussions and get into some of the dialogue. Really, this is supposed to be interactive, bring up what's on your mind, uh, kind of as our guide guidance, these three questions of, you know, what are the measures of success today, as John outlined for us? You know, more importantly, what do you think they should be? And then if, if we had them in place, how would the world look more positive and what would be the impact of that? So um, for anyone who wants to sort of jump in and um, I, my role here is really to kind of take the notes. So I'm going to be the, uh, as I mentioned, the rapporteur and report out for, for our team here. So uh, just jump in, whoever wants to go first. Well, it sounded to me like uh, Gabrielle has a, uh, uh, a view on this and, and I'll bet that Robin does too. Um, I don't know if other people are mostly here to listen or not. Would either of you guys like to, uh, Say your piece. We're not going to have much of a discussion, folks. <laughs> if we don't. Maybe we should go, back to, go ahead, jump in. I was happy to let uh, Robin speak first if she wanted to, but um, yeah, I, I think that there's. I've been involved in philosophy for children programming for since 2006. I became a trained facilitator of philosophical dialogue with kids through Montclair State University in New Jersey, which is the home for the Institute for the Advancement of uh, Philosophy for Children. And um, it started by a man named Matt Littman, who was a professor at Columbia University as John Dewey was becoming emeritus. And he took the philosophical canon this is Matt Littman. He took the philosophical canon and turned it into 16 children's novels and then wrote um, teaching manuals, very large, uh, complete teaching manuals to correspond to these children books. Um, and I think it, offshoots around the world have started in Australia and Norway and Austria and the Ben Lo region. Philosophy for Children is much more readily available on curriculums. That is not the case in the United States. Um, uh, maybe it's something about us in general that perhaps we don't want to teach people to be critical thinkers here. Um, but <laughs> it certainly um, would make the world a better place, I think, and make the world a more ethical place. And it has been shown for years that if you, um, and what I do in my practice, in my business, um, is to facilitate workshops for kids and adults in front of works of art to inform their perceptions, um, looking at the formal qualities and skeletal compositions that um, underpin works of art. Um, so when you can break things down into their formal qualities and just look at uh, plastic elements, light line, color and space and the unity and variety of those things, it can help us uh, focus more particularly on the nuance of ethical problems. And um, 
you know, uh, that that gray shadow over metaphysical criticism. Um, you can you can see you can problematize um, situations, and I think that you need to instill that in children to give them the confidence um, to to navigate um, difficult uh, ethical situations and social interactions that they have. So anywhere where I can <laughs> say, hey, everybody, look up philosophy for children and see how that you can help make the world a better place by engaging in it. Um, happy to happy to mention that. Uh, this is Robin. Gabriel, that reminds me a lot of it, Elliot Eisner's work. Sure, yes. Um, is there something in particular that- Yeah, just, uh, just, just the, the value of artwork and changing children's perspectives and his research. Anyway, um, I was gonna point out, I'm actually a lawyer that um, in terms of measures of children's success, the most recent uh, federal legislation in the US um, is called the, it was from 2015, is the Every Student Succeeds Act. So in terms of measures of success in K through 12, you've got what's um, in that statute. So we have a tremendous amount of data out there now uh, about children's success and the um, legislation actually created uh, criteria involving social and emotional learning. So all of that's now being generated in the schools and in the districts and is available to educators. So, so the, the question, that, that's, that's a great point. So people are beginning to actually measure some of the uh, social and emotional, which is really interesting because uh, in fact, actually, some countries like Vietnam, for example, and surprisingly Singapore, put the social and emotional first, and yet they're extremely successful on the other ones. Um, the question, though, is, of course, so measuring it is good. Um, what do you do about it? And, and are they the right measurements for the what do you do about it? And I shared my... Uh, story of failure or not really call it failure but story of discussion with the fragile families study no? i think i well what i would say is that there there's a tremendous amount of data that's coming in you've got the castle work from listening to webinars uh of a change to what they call transformational SEL. So you've got the data that's available to the school district, um, but the parents don't seem to understand um, just how much the focus is changing to social and emotional learning because of uh, the meaning of equity under, um, it's really being, it's under uh, fed both federal law and also mandates in the various states under state Board of Education. So I, I would say that we have a tremendous amount of data on this available to uh, anyone who's interested, but it's not being accurately reported because they don't want, want the school boards necessarily to pick up that there has been the shift. If that makes <laughs> any sense. Because and that's not necessarily what parents were looking for from the school. So there's what's actually going on, the the um, kind of traject plan trajectory, how it fits with what's going on globally versus the narrative that the parents are getting about the schools. So. Yeah, that's a problem. I mentioned that I helped uh, create a university called Minerva University. And the first year of the university is uh, teaching critical skills, critical thinking skills. Uh, it's a it's the international universe, kids from all over the world. But uh, you know the the decision was is they wherever they came from they didn't understand about critical thinking enough and the types of critical thinking there are. And in um, that platform was acquired by the Chinese and they've increased the number of students that can access it. I actually read the book about it on Minerva University and the ties to the Center for Advanced Studies in Behavioral Sciences out in California. Mm -hmm. Right. It's, it's very yeah, interested right. and it's now involved in K through 12 as well. Yeah. Yeah, Thanks, I mean, so there are these things that are happening, but um, 
Uh, I mean, I think as you made reference, there's there's a sort of political broad education dimension to it that doesn't necessarily um, allow it to be used effectively. Yeah, I would I would agree with that. Okay, just noting that we had a four minute warning. <laughs> I think popped up in our message box. So I know we heard about um, uh, critical thinking. Um, you know that 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 needs to be uh, an important element of of um, what how how can we more positively uh, some you know the use of data. Is, are there any other elements that you know we think about with being measured and what what we should be measuring or what we think they should be in addition to what we've talked about so far, if anyone wants to, you know, join into that or comment on what's already been uh, noted. Let me just sort of do some provocation, which is that, you know, it's pretty clearly this, the case that social and emotional is, is key and that critical thinking is key. But what I don't see in the general population, right, and the political class, is an understanding how about how that comes together to produce thriving children. Um, you know, it's, it's they seem to be very focused on things that were, uh, you know, new in 1920, but. Uh, uh, the sort of bigger story of what it is to make kids thrive and what you need to have happen. Uh, like in most Western countries, is much too strong a focus on individualism. So I don't care if you get along with other kids in that sort of view of the world. It's what happens between the years. Uh, whereas in other societies, um, they really care that you're part of society uh, because that's going to be a major determinant of your success uh, and they'll let society fill your brain um, and clearly you need sort of both going in there it's a sort of bigger story of uh, what are we trying to achieve that i don't see um, consensus about or, or success about No comments? Any comments? Anyone want to take them some off? Of, you know, I think it's easy. You could just take yourself off of mutes, I believe. Sure. I've got a lot of noise in my office, guys. So sorry, I've been staying on mute. But um, to your point, Sandy, with, with philosophy for children in the United States, I think I mentioned that it, it is the aim has historically been to teach um, about living in a social democracy. And so some of the pedagogical methodologies, the, the way you put children in a circle, the way turn taking happens, all of that is aimed in, in a, a socially democratic manner. When you go to, when you go to, to Norway and practice uh, philosophy for children or undergo teacher training, they have, that is not their aim at all. Um, the same thing in France, they're not, they're not concerned with a socially democratic outcome. Um, so again, yeah, we naming that's what a, that's our- That's a really interesting thing, yeah. Yeah, as a, this is like the everything I learned, everything I needed to know I learned in kindergarten. <laughs> sort of, yeah, when, when you teach kids the habits of culture, sitting in a circle, everybody gets to talk, looking for consensus, uh, and you've got four, five, six year olds, that sticks. Sure. That, that habit of mind sticks, and it's, it's critical. We also vote, you have kids vote in the American version of philosophy for children about what the topic is going to be. Um, as you go through this exercise, first is involving reading comprehension, you read a short um, a piece of stimulus together, uh, then the facilitator will sort of draw out of the children what the most important concepts are. Um, but you're also kind of giving over, giving yourself over to consensus and uh, a majority voting approach. And so um, as we know from living in a, a democratic uh, state, um, 
uh, who the majority of the people want to uh, to lead or, or what, what the majority of the room thinks is the most important concept that needs to be discussed or learned is not necessarily the most important thing that should be talked about. Um, so you also, in stating your objectives, what are you after? Are you really after the most meaningful uh, conversation that you as a teacher want to have or are you letting children exercise Yes, I believe if we could have a very quick uh, summary uh, from each of the breakout groups, that would be fantastic. Um, so let me see. Uh, Constance, would you like to start? Sorry, I was muted. So can you hear me now? Yes. 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 Okay. All right. Well, yes. Uh, thank you, Chris. And so I'll, I'll give a quick rundown of uh, what was discussed. So the three questions that we discussed were obviously the, the same as in the other rooms. What are the measures of success? What do you think they should be? And how would the world look more positive if they were indeed implemented? And um, to start off with, we had a quick discussion around the definition of what does it mean? What, 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 what do we mean by the, the terms? What do we mean by measures of success? Does it depend on uh, regional areas? Does it, does it vary depending on, on, the, on where we are in the world? And then also, if we collect the data, what do we need to do with the data? What are we looking to obtain with that data? So there was the, um, the recommendation to firstly define all of that first before we went any further. And then we figured that it's all about children and technology, children and AI. How could AI help children succeed in, in school um, and really help them with their education? And how would the world look more positive if all of these measures of success were indeed implemented well? Um, we started to talk about um, um, about racism here as an as as, in, as a children as a child as opposed to um, racism as an adult and then what does it mean to be democratic? So how would the world look more positive? So I think it was all about what does it mean to be living in a, in a democratic uh, in a democracy and. John, if you'd like to add anything, anything I might, may have forgotten? No, I think you nailed it. I was going to say, I think the thing, um, uh, we had such a thoughtful group, uh, and Vladimir, Tala, Sabine, everyone else, thank you so much. Um, and also, uh, Vladimir, at the end, I'm going to probably misquote you, but uh, I thought what you were saying was lovely, you know, in terms of if we know our children, the technology is measuring their happiness. Uh, uh, well, now I'm going to add this part to it. What if then that became, this is John's layer, you know, what if that became the goal? So that instead of saying, how do we build stuff to measure kids' happiness for the sake of it, the ultimate goal for all the technology was how do we increase children's long-term well-being as a starting point? Then all those other questions too, what data are we collecting? What region um, and even aspects maybe of racism would be thought about? Anyways, a great room. Great, thank you so much for that. Um, and I'm wondering, maybe I just jump in here and give a quick synopsis of our group. I was with Venera. Oops, thank you for the reminder to start my video. <laughs> I was in Venera's group and uh, we had a discussion, an interesting discussion that started off by talking about the fact that really the measurement doesn't have a lot to do with technology. It has more uh, to do with subjective factors. Um, so we dove into that for a little while. And it was also brought up that children should be participating in all of this, in this measurement and in this now, starting now, because they will be growing into the generation that's of course also working on this and should start giving input as of now. Um, Another point raised was that um, technology should allow children's creativity. So somehow if we can get in their measures of creativity or uh, that, that correspond with that very important factor um, and that 
the, it was emphasized once again that it's it's not just on the use of technology. Those shouldn't be our only measures. Um, the technology is just a means. So um, we, we kept coming back to that. Um, and I think, I think that those were the main, uh, uh, there was one other thread about open-ended settings where kids can design their own learning trajectories and keeping that fact in mind that things need to be, um, loose enough such that, again, the children can guide things. So it was mainly, if I had to say sort of a theme running out through our discussion was that let's help put the children in the driver's seat and it's not all about measuring the technology per se. So, and Venera, do you have anything to add to that? It's on mute. Oh, um, Venera, Venera, I'm sorry, I didn't hear. I think you were on mute. You're still on mute. Is it better? There, that's good. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you so much. I think uh, just one additional thought to add is that we need to also look at different vulnerable groups within the child population in general. So looking, you know, what it would be uh, the measures of success for children with special needs. What about children that are orphans without parental care, uh, children on the streets, uh, you know, children that have been severely abused, you know? And so I think we really need to tease out the different elements because I think, you know, sometimes we have groups of children that are experien experiencing, you know, multiple vulnerabilities. And so that's going to have another role when we talk about success and how we measure and how we promote well being for these children. Thank you. Thanks, Venera. And Karen, if you would like to share um, some thoughts that came out of your break session with Sandy. Definitely. Actually, we started from a very, I think, very unique and, and thoughtful place, um, hearing about some work uh, out of Montclair State uh, University in New Jersey on a philosophy for children program. And really the focus here, thinking about critical thinking and how do we teach children critical thinking and, and, and actually through even the use of, of art and you know how that can improve their perspectives um, and, and uh, through their through their for life quite frankly when you look at driving and, and, and I guess kind of um, um, navigating if you will uh, you know some ethical challenges and issues that they might be facing it was really quite um, eye-opening personally for me to think of it from that perspective as well. So we definitely want to thank Gabrielle for bringing that to the table. You know, we also talked about, you know, sort of these measures of success and, you know, there's sort of this data, uh, you know, being captured, uh, a lot of data coming in uh, that can be transformational, especially uh, sort of in the, in the school system, if you will, the education system. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, and this shift to how do we measure and understand social and emotional learning but sometimes it's a little bit of a challenge because uh, the, the caregivers, if you will, uh, the parents, et cetera, of the children don't quite uh, understand what that really is, is about. You know, and that could be my own layer on this is, you know, uh, the parents sort of came through an education system. This is maybe more of a U.S. Um, view as well, you know, with not maybe being exposed to that type of, of, of learning. And, and how do we sort of measure and how do we address social and emo uh, emotional learning in addition to, you know, sort of learning the, the basics and the traditional things that we do in school. So we, we sort of have this um, critical thinking piece, the, the social and emotional learning aspects of this, but also um, this concept of social democracy and how, um, you know, in various parts of the world, how the learning environments are, are set up uh, for, you know, for children to feel, you know, to the point that you were making that children should be part of this as well. And, and how um, even uh, maybe um, uh, inadvertently, you know, the way that, uh, you know, their voices are heard and, and their contribution to their own learning is addressed in various parts of the world could also be put into the mix as well. So I know we're short on time, so I'll, I'll end there, but I really want to give a big shout out and a thank you to the, to the group that we had, Sandy, because I, I, you know, some really interesting perspectives. So thank you. Great, thank you so much for all of those uh, wrap ups. 
And John, I want to hand it to you to give your impressions and take uh, close the session um, with some parting thoughts. Just mainly a huge thank you. Uh, first of all, to Venera and Sandy. Sandy, I know I had to go to his next call, but round of applause, even though it's digital or virtual, to Venera and Sandy. Also, uh, Venera, your colleague, Branka Panak, uh, such a huge fan of her work and what you do at AI for Peace. I want to thank all the colleagues at the WISIS Forum, technically, who made this possible, uh, to Karen, to Kristen, my team at IEEE. Uh, and just that, you know, I think one thing I, I from our group that I got is, wouldn't it be amazing, I'm, I'm now just wrapping up to say, if we all knew exactly what it was that would bring long-term well-being for kids, and wouldn't it be amazing if every meeting started with, how do we make that work, versus most of the meetings I'm at start with economics. How do we make the economics work? Which is a critical question to ask, but what if it was the other way around? What if it was, how do we make our kids' well-being work? And then we make the economics and everything else, as it were, serve that measure. Um, I think that's a pretty good goal. And that's what I got from our, our conversations today is I think everyone actually kind of agrees with that. But the systems that we have and how to change the order of design is, uh, is a big challenge. So I'll just say, um, for my part, such an honor to be here. Kristen, thank you so much. And uh, I'm a parent. So just want to add that these issues are top of mind to me and uh, really exciting to know that these beautiful technologies, by the way, another thing we all agreed on last point is that everyone loves the technology. We're geeks like me, but the technology can be used for good or evil, but it is certainly not inert. We must protect our kids. And what a wonderful opportunity, especially in an era of COVID when caregivers are so focused on, let's prioritize our kids first. Uh, potentially with these technologies. That's the measure mentality that I know we created this episode as it were for. So thanks again. Thank you, John, for that wrap up. And also I want to mention that uh, John has a series, uh, Measure Mentality. Did you want to mention that, John, before we part? You're, you're uh, on mute, I think. I should have put that, thank you so much for mentioning that, Kristen. The link here in the chat room um, uh, is for this episode of uh, the show called Measure Mentality. There's both a podcast component and a webinar component. Uh, Sandy's actually been on it a couple of times now, where we're trying to do our best to ask many, many people from different areas these questions. You all actually would love to have you go to, there's a section of the site where you can submit your, question, your answers, much like we did today. And thanks for mentioning that, Kristen. We'd love to have more people participate in that work. Sure, sure thing. Thank you so much. And actually, uh, before we part, I don't like to leave with someone's hand up. Uh, Vladimir, did you have a question? I just wanted to uh, say uh, thank you to all of you on behalf of uh, this is team, this is forum, ITU. It's been really uh, great to, uh, to be a part of this uh, Knowledge Cafe. Uh, I have to say, one of the formats that we missed uh, at the Versus Forum, uh, as in the past, it was always physical. And I remember always IEEE has organized uh, one Knowledge Cafe uh, each uh, week. Uh, we were holding uh, Versus Forum in the past. And uh, luckily now, Zoom also allows us these breakout rooms. Uh, and this is something that uh, really has been uh, an inspiring thing, uh, and this is uh, why I think this is the case. Um, most of us dedicate our timely uh, uh, activities, uh, daily activities, to the ongoing, you know, plans, uh, work schedules, and we do implementing. Of course, there is some planning, but it's really, you know, uh, again based on you know the existing frameworks. And such these kind of exercises, when we are really, you know, going out and uh, openly discuss, uh, being intrigued uh, on old and new concepts of you know technology and humans uh, are really important for, for all of us. Uh, so I really like to thank John for his uh, moderation uh, in the breakout room. I also like to uh, thank to Sabine and Tala for also sharing their uh, thoughts and questions openly. We have a lot of questions. We don't have a lot of answers. Maybe AI uh, is already you know helping us understand uh, how we can change uh, the way we uh, work or live. Uh, but going back to the well-being, I believe uh, what we at least uh, can uh, you know look into is uh, having AI 
bring together a common denominator because as a society we have to you know get some things uh, you know as, uh, as 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 common as possible but also at the same time it should you know help us uh, you know continue to be curious uh, to be uh, you know creative to really grow as individuals so we are really having an opportunity uh, for you know to to, to continue uh, you know with healthy aging and, and you know growing well uh, and I get, I hope that this session is just uh, one of these uh, moments where we can sparkle this discussion in the future. So thanks again for you know really you know kind of uh, refreshing um, this uh, this this event and thanks again to all the support from from IEEE and its members. Great. Thank you so much, Vladimir. And with that, and a thank you to everyone and gratitude for actually being able to interact with people. Um, I'll leave you for today. And uh, I look forward to meeting you again at some point in the future, hopefully. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.